Welcome to the totally awesome outdoor show. We're down here at Furnace Mill Fishery and they've got an air gun range here and it's something to see because there's a variety of ranges you go on and with me is the owner, Ed Brown. Ed is actually going to tell me something about it and what's on offer here. Ed, good to see you. Thank you, thank you. Now you've got a beautiful setting here. You've obviously got woodland, everything. And I see you've got your fishing lake behind you for those who want to go fishing. But if we sit down, can you just give us a run through basically, you know, what the whole operation is here and what's on offer. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, well we're here at the zeroing and plinking area at Furnace Mill Fishery and Air Gun Range, um, which is, there's distances on the range here from eight yards out to 45 yards. We, we have a discipline um, which we work to, which is uh, HFT, which is short for Hunter Field Target Shooting, and that most of their targets are within those ranges, anything between 8 and 45 yards. Now, I see this is on an upward slope. Do you have to have that, that ground barrier at the back as the pellet goes off? Is we, that why you've got it here? We do like to use a natural backstop, yeah, for safety reasons. Okay. Now, just for people to know, this is, tell us a little bit, if they, if they want to get into air rifles, or indeed any shooting, you've got to zero and this is why it's called a zero range. Just explain what that's about. Absolutely, yeah. The zeroing is, is to find where the pellet hits the target at a certain distance. Mm. You might like to zero your gun at 25, 30, 35 yards, something yeah, in, in, around those sort of figures and things, which means your aim point will be um, when you're looking at the target, that range it will be hitting it perfectly in the in middle. In the centre. And then you'll get pellet sort of drop or elevation at certain ranges. Some, some closer ones you'll find are higher, some closer ones from further away you'll find the pellet drops and things. Um, and also then you have to think about the wind blowing, it will blow the pellet and air gun pellet from side to side as well. Now would you make an adjustment with the sight for that, you know, with the telescopic sight? They'll all adjust, I imagine, like a, a full-on, say, deer rifle, would they? Yeah, it, it is, a, you will adjust. Once you've made that adjustment to that zero range, then you won't really fiddle with the scope at all then. Oh, really? Unless you were shooting another type of air gun discipline, which is called field target shooting, and they can adjust their scopes during um, a shot or in between a shot and a, or in a competition. With hunter field target shooting, once that scope is set, yes. you can't touch it at all. You need it, especially yeah. in a competition. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, just run me through the different uh, ranges you've got here. This is the zero one, this is the first one you come to. What's the rest of the features you've got here? Okay, yeah. Um, we've got a 30 target course to the left of it, which is set out to United Kingdom Hunterfield target specification. Um, I mean, don't let that terminology put off anybody who's new to the sport. We just base it on that, so we've got a sort of aim for a, a, you know, goal, goal post to sort of aim for, really. Um, we really want people just to come and have a fun day here in a safe environment, which is obviously very important with air guns. But then moving on, we've got five um, courses altogether. So even on our busiest days of the week, if we do happen to have a competition, we always keep other courses open for people who just turn up and pay on the day, on a day for the ticket basis, really. So you can you can you can buy your day ticket here if you like, and you can go on different courses. And, and sort of rotate, try different ones if you want to. Yeah, that, that's the idea, really. Yeah, we, the the main course which is open to the to the public for a day sort of shooting is normally the one um, to the left of the plinking area here. Um, but we do open other ones on certain days. The, the other courses tend to be competition courses. Yes. Um, so um, and they, they get to see different areas of the shooting ground. But okay. it's not, you know, would you ever give everybody a fair crack at the whip and let them have a look around the whole site, really? Okay. Now, when I was much younger, that's a long time ago, guys, a very long time ago. Um, it was 177 and two twos, and it was like a, a, a spring or break breech barrel. Now, I imagine it's moved on from there. So, what is there now that people can go and buy? What should they be looking at? Yeah. Well, the, the brake barrel springers are still around, actually, and people do use them, although you don't see so many of them now here. Um, we moved on to um, pre-charged air guns now, which um, will have compressed air in, in them. Um, they still have to be sub 12 foot pounds to be within the legal limit of, of having an air gun before it moves on to a firearm certificate. Oh really? Yes, yes. Um, but uh, yeah, you're right. So we, it, it's 177 predominantly, 
two two do come into it. For instance, if we had a competition here, you'd probably find out of sixty shooters, yeah. um, three or four might be using spring brake barrel guns. Oh, still, still, yeah, yeah. yeah. and maybe one or two using two two caliber, but the majority would be using one seven seven. Is that right? No, I thought they would have gone for the two two. I thought yeah. that would have been a standard dollars, yeah. as it were, but it's not. No, it's one seven seven for target shooting generally. Yeah, okay, it's yeah. most common now. Now the other thing a must have changed guys out there is the pellet. The shape of the pellet, the weight of the pellet, what it's made for. Just tell some of the beginners so they know maybe even the BB little balls I've seen. You know, what's 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 the ammo? What's the ammo for beginners? Okay, yeah, um, still still basically a lead pellet um, in the different calibers. Uh, on the sites type of shooting we tend to use the sort of dome headed yes. air gun pellets. Like, right with the wasted skirts still, is it, it with yeah. the, with the Little gap at the back for the air to go in. That's I guess. exactly right. Yeah, yeah, and and a lot of the, some of the top shooters will go to the lengths of weighing them and making oh sure there's no damage and it, so yeah, make, inspecting them really. Um, I don't do that personally, yeah. and, and it's only really the top shooters who are going for that real pinpoint accuracy. Yeah. Pinpoint accuracy. Yeah. Now uh, move on to you can go out and shoot and eat things, can't you? You know, I don't know. I'm going to say this. Pigeons and, and, and rabbits and stuff like that. Absolutely. Just, yeah. just tell us a little bit about that. What should you be doing? Okay. Uh, yeah. I guess kill zone comes into it. You know, the length of pellet travels before it kills something because you want to kill something outright if you can. Just run it through that as well because a lot of guys like fishing. You want to catch something, you want to eat something if you're trout fishing or salmon yeah. fishing. Some of the guys probably will want to go and try it full on for hunting. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, air, air gunning it, it is a recognised method of certain um, control, especially vermin and things. Yes. I've actually been in employed uh, recently to set up um, a squir squirrel control initiative for the whole of the wild forest area um, using our members for our, from our air gun thing, club and things to, to control grey squirrels which yes. is becoming an increasing problem within forestry and causing millions of pounds worth of damage to forestry each year. Yeah. Um, part of my job with that is to liaise with landowners around the whole of the wire forest, especially the private landowners, and promote squirrel shooting using air guns yep. as, a, as a control method really. Most of the shots will be towards a feeder where we encourage yes. them um, to come and feed so we get a safe shot and we know where that squirrel is going to be and we're not shooting towards any sort of public footpaths and things yeah. and we can just turn our sound crew ourselves so we're shooting into the ground. Again that's uh, that backstop sort of thing, safety factor. Exactly yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and with that um, we can keep accurate records of what's been shot for, for, for the landowners and the distance we generally set our sort of little hides up and things yeah. away from the feeder would be about 30 to 40 yards. Yeah. Reasonable that, distance still. Reasonable yeah. difference, dis, distance but um, far enough away so the quarry aren't, aren't don't know we're there really yeah. Yeah. but close enough to take a very accurate headshots so are instant. Now, I'm going to say something because I was out fishing a couple of days ago, shark fishing on my boat with Wayne Combin, who's done shooting as well. And he was telling me this, exactly this. We're, funny, we were talking about grey squirrels. He's been shooting them in his back garden because they're on his bird feeder. He was telling me they will kill chicks. They will take eggs. Oh, yeah. So guys out there, if you think, oh my God, the poor little squirrel, I don't think a lot of people realise they are classified as vermin. <laughs> you know, and as you say, they can do a hell of a lot of damage. Yeah, I, I can't remember the actual figure now, but I read somewhere, I think, that the DEFRA, the ministry people, um, had calculated about 14 billion, mil, sorry, 14 million pounds worth of damage each wow. year really? to forestry alone, let alone all the wildlife in the air. Yeah, yeah Wayne was talking about the things. wildlife and top birds and that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Now, the other thing about shooting squirrels, sounds like sort of great fun to me because there's a bit of sport in there. Every time I've seen a squirrel, it's run around the back of the tree. So that's the idea of bringing the feeder around the front. Yeah. I can see that now, yeah. yeah. What about rabbits? What would you do for rabbits? Rabbits again, yeah. Um, it's, it's quite nice to go out um, for rabbits, usually early morning, first light in the evening, and stalk into them. Part of the the um, skill is being able to get as close to your quarry as you possibly can, yep. uh, and taking a nice, swift, clean shot. Really. Yes. 
Um, and, and that's the pleasure I would get, certainly, is, is getting close without them knowing that I'm there. Yeah. The hunting, that is coming the into hunting, it, isn't it? Yeah. That's the aspect, I can exactly. see that, exactly yeah. that, yeah. Mm. Now, Ed, obviously, high-powered rifles, that type of thing, fully licensed. Is there any form of licensing, or do you need gun covers for, for air guns? Well, we're still okay, actually, in England, uh, no licensing. You can walk into a gun shop as long as you're over the, over the age of um, 18 and buy one. Sub 12 foot pounds yes. air gun. But in Scotland, um, this year, um, we're in 2016 now, it's just become law that you have to have a license for an air gun in Scotland, yeah. We set up this about nine years ago, actually, and we, we went into it very sort of carefully because we didn't want to, the fishing was our main business. Sure. And we didn't want to disrupt the fishing and things. But gradually we found that um, some of the fishers wanted to do shooting, some of the shooters wanted to go fishing, and it all worked very well. We got to be on site to maintain the place anyway. Uh, and, it, and in those nine years, we've seen a massive increase in the numbers really? of people coming shooting. Yeah, that's great. And one assumes younger, younger people could come in it with adult supervision as well. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, we get a lot of youngsters, which is nice. We're getting less and less youngsters coming into fishing, which is a bit worrying. But lots of youngsters coming into the air gun side of things, which is, which is great. But there's no discrimination. We get disabled people. We get people in wheelchairs. We get youngsters, a lot of retired people. Um, they all come and uh, thoroughly enjoy it. Yeah. That's good, that's good. Well, I can hear them popping away here, all doing the zero in. Maybe uh, some of your guys here would uh, show us around their guns. Yeah, absolutely. I could introduce you to a couple of the regular members who sure. come up and maybe they'd like to talk through their guns. That'd be good what they're doing, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Hi, I'm Mick and I'm, I'm a member here at Furnace Mill. I come up here shooting HFT. And um, basically, I use this predominantly. This is the competition gun. It's an HW101. It's got a couple of little modifications to the stock, but it's pretty much standard otherwise. This is my preferred scope, it's a Rhino. I shoot on quite a low magnification. A lot of the shooters shoot on about 10 times. Use mill dot scopes, which this is. Um, it's a PCP rifle, so basically it's nice and easy to shoot. You just cock it down here, you pull the lever back, and that's cocked. You put a pellet in on the breech, which I ain't got at the moment, which is really well prepared, but I'll get that one because I'm good like that and you pull it in here on the slot pointing forward and then you just push the lever forward and that's the gun loaded right basically as I was saying it's a PCP which stands for pre-charged pneumatic and what it is it's basically compressed air and it fills up off of this here it's a dive bottle and it's got, got a probe on it which is here and that basically goes into the front of the gun I'll just fire it off because it is loaded and basically, that just goes into a little hole. There, pushes right the way in, and then you fill it up with air, up until the 200, which it is nearly full. And that's it, basically. And then you're ready to go for about 90 shots. As I was saying, it's a single shot, which means it's one pellet at a time, which just goes onto the, to the tray here. You can get them with magazines, which make them multi-shots, but for target shooting, you don't really need a multi-shot. There's your pellets here. And as I says, I'm just 177. Put it onto the tray, load it, and you're ready to go. Manual safety on these, that's safe, it won't shoot. And then it's ready to fire. Basically, you pull it up, little flip up to keep it clean, aim at your target, and fire. That's it, job done. All right, basically, this is a carbine gun, which means it's quite short, stubby, got a short barrel. Um, in all fairness, it doesn't make a great deal of difference. The carbines, I think, was more invented for when you're hunting in more confined spaces. But um, I find shooting it, there's less movement from the middle of gun to the front of the gun when I use a carbine. A longer gun moves a little bit more at the front when you wiggle. So that's it, really. There's not a lot of difference other than that. All right, basically, you could use this for pest control if you wanted to, which, like, sort of your little squirrels and rabbits to be in a bit of a pain. But normally you would use one that's silenced, so when you shoot something, the others don't run off, basically. And um, it's like I say, whether it's full length carbine, it doesn't make no difference whether it's a springer, they can all be used, as long as you can shoot accurate with them. You could use a bigger scope. This is more a target fired scope. If you've got a bigger front lens, it drags more lighting, so you can see a little bit better in dusky conditions. Right, as I was saying, when you fill the rifle, you fill it with a probe in here with compressed air, and you fill it up to 200 bar. Basically, a dive bottle, when it's filled from a shop, wherever it's filled, or a dive centre, it's filled up to 300 bar, 
but that just allows you to get more fills out of the bottle. When you're at 200 bar on this, it shoots at just under 12 foot pound, about 11 free if you want to be precise, which is a pretty much ideal place to be. You get different rifles, they may fill up to 160, 170, 180 bar. Some are regulated, some are not. But the ultimate goal is to get your rifle shooting around the 11 foot free, 11 foot 5 pound mark, which is well under the legal limit, otherwise you need an FAC license if it goes over 12 foot pound. And um, it's like you just sort of shoot away with them, you get about 90 shots out of this gun, some guns you get a little less, some guns you get a little bit more. It all depends basically on the capacity of the cylinder, what you've got on your rifle. Right, now I'm going to just check my zero on the gun. I zero this gun at 25 yards, which I think a lot of shooters do. So let's basically load up, it says. And what I do here, there's a board out there at 25 yards and I'm aiming to hit the bullseye. And that way I know my rifle's shooting straight for when I do a what's now. So I'll just do that now. that's not far off it's a little bit high so what I would do there I would take the turret cap off at the top and this is how to adjust your zero and where you're gonna aims on here this is for up and down and basically it's anti-clockwise up and clockwise down so if I move about three or four clicks that should bring it down enough for the next shot what I'm aiming to do 25 yards will be the top of my trajectory because an air rifle will shoot with a bit of an arc in it so therefore, if I shoot at 10 yards or 45 yards, the pellet will hit lower than the top of the arc. So I'm aiming to get myself a nice trajectory where it's something like ease and from 10 yards to 45 yards, and then when I go on a course to shoot an HFT competition, I know where my aim points are, which is like mill dots, which when you look down the scope, you would see. I'm not sure if you can do that with your camera, so, but we can try. Position basically for zeroing in, you want to be as still as possible. Take all the human error out of it so the gun's perfectly still, all as perfect as you can get it. I use one of these rests, which I'm provided by Ed up here. I think someone's donated them in the past. They're quite sturdy, protect your gun quite well. And what I do, I rest the front of the hamster, which is the bottom part of the gun here, and I put my hand at the back so it's nice and still when I put my shoulder to the rifle. It's nice and still, and I can keep perfectly still while I'm shooting. And there you go, job done. It's so far you can do that. So here we are on the Hunterfield target course. This consists of 30 targets set out in the woodland environment from ranges between 8 yards would be in the closest and 45 yards being the furthest away. Um, some of them might look further away than that but that's the art of our deception really to try and try and um, get the air gunners thinking that they're different ranges and making a mistake on, the, on those. Basically each target is a knockover target which is at the end of each string and if the pellet passes through the, the hole in the target, hits the paddle, the target will fall over and we use the string to reset the target after it's been shot. This is a shooting position which is marked by a peg it can be varying lengths. The standard length is normally about 18 inches or so high but we do use longer ones for extra support and things occasionally and then it's clearly numbered uh, the, the target or lane number uh, there. So. Um, each lane is marked with a post here, uh, which is uh, in hunter field target shooting, you must be in contact with that post. It can be any part of your body, your foot, your hand, the gun, any part at all must be in, in contact with that. That's so we can position the targets in certain ways and also it's a safety point of view as well. It stops people standing away from the target and potentially somebody could wander in front of them. Right, 
Right, basically I'm going to shoot this target for you. I use a mat because I'm going to shoot prone on this one. And basically, it's a little bit grippy up here. Stop your elbow slipping around so you don't slip while taking a shot. So there you go. Don't never load your rifle until you make the fire line. So what I do, I lie down. And as you'll see, the muzzle of the rifle's over the fire line. It says, and then I'm safe to load up. I load the pellet, and we're ready to go. I'm allowed to use the post, and what I do in my style, I have the butt of the rifle on the floor, which is here. So, here we go. This is named actually the Enchanted Wood by one of our regular shooters who, when he first shot this during a, a national competition, which we set it up for, um, he said that his pellets were guided by fairies because the, the different terrain and environments and things can, can cause your pellets to do different things here. There's, there's elements of wetland, there's some water, and, uh, and they, they do do strange things. So this was named the Enchanted Wood course. It was set up. Um, for a UK a HFT national competition where 140 shooters took part um, and we've since used it uh, for a big um, field target shooting competition where um, there was a large number of shooters that came and took part in that and you'll see there's about 70 targets out on this course 40 that were used for the field target which is a slightly different discipline to uh, the hunter field target and then there's 30 targets set out which we use for the national competition. Mm -hmm. 